It's the Mike Novak Show with Peggy Malecki. Green, gardening, and environment radio. Flavored with a dash of humor. Welcome to intelligent, irreverent talk about plants and the planet they grow on. Your questions, comments, and participation are always welcome on Facebook and Instagram at The Mike Novak Show and at Mike Now on Twitter. Good planets are hard to find. Temperate zones and tropic climes. And true currents and thriving seas. Wind blowing through breathing trees. Strong ozone and safe sunshine. Well, good planets are hard to find. Good planets are in the main. Brought to you by Bartlett Tree Experts. Every tree needs a champion. Go to Bartlett.com. Jet streams, perfect air. And here they are, Peggy Malecki and Mike Nova. Good planets are in the main. Right. And uh, I, uh, I, I am definitely not ready for this show. I have just decided that uh, there's just, <laughs> it's just too much going on. So uh, good morning. Uh, good morning. Good, uh, good morning, everybody, and glad you're uh, you're with us. Boy, we got a jam packed program today. Uh, it's that's be a, fun. Yeah, I think so. We've got some great guests, and they've all checked out. Uh, I, we, we all have our flowers. Oh, right. We have our hippie astrums. Uh, and let's get, uh, wait, there's a hippie astrum ding on that side and one on that side. Uh, cool. There, there it is. Uh, mm-hmm. Many of you will call this an amaryllis. You are mistaken. That is not an amaryllis. Uh, now, this is not a, um, it's, it's not a mission of mine to get everybody to call them <laughs> hippie astrums. I, yes, it is. Yeah, no, it's. I have enough issues uh, and enough uh, <laughs> rants in my life. Uh, this is not one of them. I don't care. Yeah, but it is a hippie astrum, really. It look, call it, them an amaryllis if you'd like. It, if you go to my website, mikenovak.net, I put it up there on the blog post uh, because our, our second group of guests, uh, one of them is Kaida Muhammad, who's a friend of mine and an activist uh, in gardening and uh, local food in Chicago, uh, and beekeeper. We'll be talking to her and to Jana uh, Hinsman, about, uh, who runs a Bike a Bee which is uh, a, a, she basically takes care of hives and does it while riding on around bike. on her bike. How cool. A uh, kinsman. I said hinsman. It's kinsman. kinsman. Sorry. Um, she's the founder and owner and biker at Bikeaby. Uh, but uh, Kaida Muhammad uh, uh, was growing these, and um, she uh, <laughs> calls them um, hippie. Uh, she spells it H-A- Hippie asters. Hippie asters, and that's fine with me too. If you want a hippie aster, you know, you know, we call poinsettias ponzetters, and that's fine too. So we don't have to worry about uh, uh, how to pronounce Dan it. Dan Cost is watching, and he's cringing already. Oh uh, no, is he? I'm sorry, Dan. Why are you cringing? Come on, man. It's, but his uh, snow crocus are blooming. So, um, uh, and, and so speaking me, of gardening, yeah. Speaking of gardening, you go for it. I'm going to let you while I pop up on the uh, on the restream uh, chat box here. The garden season is starting, and if you're a spring gardener, if you're a summer gardener, a community gardener, you're going to want to take part in the Chicago Community Gardeners Association 8th Annual Virtual Conference. Last year's conference Sorry. got caught up in COVID, but this year they've got um, the whole thing's virtual, and it's happening on Saturday, March 20th from 9 a.m. to 3.30 p.m., and it's called Connections Through Gardening, Plants, People, and the Environment 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 that was your cue and registration is $25 for adults $15 for students scholarships are available if you sign up and you go you get to see us we'll be we'll be on the schedule as well yeah well actually we'll be there representing Chicago Excellence in Gardening Awards which yeah in 2021, we're back, and I think we're going to be doing more videos this year. Last year, because of the pandemic, we didn't go out to people's gardens and judge individually. Uh, mm-hmm. 
we had you send in videos. And we're going to start earlier this year because one of the things that we everybody complains about well, in what? Can, can, before we forget, let me give the website for CCTV. Oh, all right, go for it. ChicagoCommunityGardens.org slash conference. Or just go to ChicagoCommunityGardens.org and there's a big link right there for you. Right. And that is on March 20th. Um, yeah, just go and, and they're on Facebook as well and they're on Twitter. Um, and um, it's uh, going to be a great conference. We, uh, we checked it out with uh, JW the other day who walked us through their, uh, their uh, platform. And they're going to have lots of sessions, lots of good stuff. And Chicago Excellence in Gardening Awards is going to be there. We're going to show some of the videos that, uh, the, from winning gardens mm -hmm. last year. Um, and they were all people's choice, just let you know. That's how, the, that's how you won last year. It was a people's choice yeah. thing. Uh, we'll and, see what uh, happens this year. And, and we're going to make a pitch to get people. And the point I was going to make is that we're going to start in the spring, we hope. The, the goal is to get gardeners in the spring because the, one of the complaints about uh, garden, garden judging and garden awards is that it, 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 there's a bias toward middle and late in the season. And everybody, and I'm included, always say, you should have seen my garden in May. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I think that works out better for uh, a lot of people, so we will do that. All right. Uh, and uh, I have only one more thing that I'm going to play for you uh, because uh, you requested it, Peggy. So here it is. Weird is part of the job. So there you go. Weird is part of the job. See, uh, another drop in. Weird is part of the job. And that is by request. Thank you, Captain Janeway. Thank you, Captain Janeway. I got to boost the sound a little bit on that. I'm going to do that. And, and our, our, Ooh, our Casey's G listening today. Hey, Casey. And by the way, a shout out to Dan <laughs> Costa, who's watching, and he says, "Hey, I was the one who started Ponzetters. Well, you might have. I, 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 I steal most of my material from uh, Dan Costa, who works at Vern Goer's Greenhouse in Hinsdale. <laughs> you see, you're getting a ding, and you're getting a, a promotion there for for the green house so uh uh some uh, someday soon i have to do you know what when we have susan harris from garden rant on in a few weeks uh we're going to go through the four-step program that dan costa came up with and that i have i stole and i use in all my garden talks it's my version and dan's version of uh the four-step program but uh mm -hmm. this is not about four-step programs uh, our guest there uh, on the lower left, as you can see, is Marie Chiepo. And yes. uh, uh, I got it right, huh? How about you that? Did. I'll, give, I'll give myself Thank a dang. Um, and, I uh, want one of those. Okay, this, is, this one's for you. There you go. You get that. Everybody has to have a bell. You just walk around with it. And everybody <laughs> has... Everybody I has. Use, I use it on Zoom meetings, and it always gets people just laughing. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> How to bring attention to oneself. Oh, my goodness. Casey Tomato is with us this morning, too, listening from his lounge chair. So good for him. He's in Kansas City, of course. That's why we call him Casey Tomato. And he, he breeds tomatoes. So I've grown some of his varieties, and they're, they're quite terrific. Oh, wonderful. So it's good to have friends who, uh, who do things like that because they send you seeds. Um, and that hint, leads us hint, in, right, hint, and that leads hint, us into hint. our conversation here. Uh, yes, you may do that, uh, Casey, this year as well. Uh, if you uh, grow from seed, you don't have to buy things that are a problem and end up in landfills. And, of course, I'm talking about plastic pots. Um, one way to get away from that whole issue is uh, to plant things from seed. But the reason that Marie is here is she wrote a, a white paper last year, uh, and it's about the plastics in our horticultural industry you know we call it the green industry um and it's sometimes not so green as as we know uh plastic pots are one uh you you could talk about chemical use sometimes uh being part of that uh but in this case we're talking about plastic because uh it's something we talk about on this show all the time and it's something that I've been following for now. It's got to be at least 13 years because I went back um, 
and found a couple of articles by Beth Botts, who's a friend of the show, who's a writer for the Chicago Tribune uh, and, a, and a bunch of places. And, okay, she gets a ding on this end, too. Okay. Um, and uh, she has been known to, uh, to host the show uh, in, in the past and is certainly uh, welcome anytime and a uh, terrific writer. And I found two articles from her when we were talking about this back in the day. One is from 2009, then a follow-up five years later, from 2014. Um, mm-hmm. So, and I'm not even sure, Marie, how I, I know, I, I was trying to trace back how I found out about your paper, and I know, it, I think it might have been through Facebook, because I wrote to you on Facebook and said, hey, uh, this is interesting, how do I find out more about it? Uh, Marie, by the way, is a designer, gardener, horticulturist. Uh, she runs Eco Plant Plans LLC in Needham, Massachusetts. That's just outside of Boston. Um, your white paper was published by the Association of Professional Landscape Designers (APLD). A lot of our listeners uh, might know about that organization. If they don't, um, well, first of all, tell us about your uh, your business and then about APLD. Oh, gosh. Well, my business started 23 years ago. Uh, it's basically, uh, or it's organic based. Everything I do is is organic. Um, I'm recently an accredited organic land care professional. Yay, yay. Uh, <laughs> yay. But I, <laughs> yeah, there you go. There go the dings again. <laughs> I need a dinger. Um, and I, I, design uh, I used to maintain um, and and install uh, plant material uh, but basically it's as one would refer to as sustainable land landscape design um, I take into consideration all of the elements of the landscape uh, right plant right place which I'm sure you've all heard about yep um, mm-hmm. and it's I'm happy to say it's it's something that people are really seeking more of right now I've had I'm, a lot of inquiries. Yeah, I imagine you're a member of the ELA. I sure am. Yeah, okay, sure that's am. the Ecological which, Landscape which is Landscape Alliance. E- Ecological Landscape Alliance, and it was the model for the Midwest Eco- Ecological Landscape Alliance, which I was a co-founder mm-hmm. of. And unlike the e- ELA, uh, Mila, our, our version of it, uh, gave up the ghost uh, about three years ago. Um, and uh, got absorbed by the Illinois Landscape Contractors Association, but it still exists in that there's a conference each year that uh, ILCA does, which is called Impact, and um, Mm -hmm. it is a way to get uh, landscapers uh, to use gentler means of gardening and and have less of an impact on the planet. And, And again, this leads us to all kinds of things, and one of those things is plastic pots. So yes, yes. why did you do this white paper for APLD? So I'm a member of the sustainability committee for APLD. Uh, and one of our committee members had uh, a very wonderful long conversation with uh, the sustainable, the person in, in charge of sustainability for the Missouri Botanical Gardens, which 20 some odd years ago, was the uh, basically the model uh, that prompted the plastics recycling movement? Uh, yeah, they, they were they were they were collecting pots. They they even yes. had a grinder for a while, and yes. they were and, yep. and 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 at the time. And I, you and I talked the other day. Uh, mm-hmm. They they were. I got a bunch of. Uh, 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 garden centers together in Chicago for a few meetings and said, hey, we got to do this because the Missouri Botanical Garden is doing this. We can do it in Chicago. That, sure. whole, th- that whole thing fizzled in about six months. Um, yes. It's, it's yes. really a hard problem. And why, it's and, a large, large problem. Why is that, Marie? It's a huge problem because, first of all, uh, the whole plastics recycling industry is... is uh, a disaster but yep. uh, pots mm-hmm. in particular have we have difficulty recycling one of the reasons being that the black plastic pots uh, really cannot be recycled if you go if you go to a nursery uh, 
as a designer, I go to wholesale nurseries and I see thousands upon thousands of single plants in, in these little black pots. Those are typically not recycled because the optical readers at the recycling facilities cannot read the black. They cannot read the pigment black. Uh, and also pots need to be de decontaminated. They need to be collected. Uh, they are all made up of various resins, some of which um, are more recyclable than others, but uh, it's costly for, for example, I think one thing that people uh, didn't fully realize when this paper came out was overall there is a huge problem with the plastic pots uh, disposal uh, issue. It is a particularly large problem for those of us in the industry that purchase these plants. I go through hundreds of pots in a season and what I normally do is I return it to the vendor that I purchased the pots from with the thinking that these pots are going to be properly recycled or people have them collected by a recycling company or they dispose of them at their own recycling facility. What I learned that was so jaw dropping to me was with all of this good faith in place, these pots are not going through these grinders. These pots are not even making it to the facilities. Uh, another one of the reasons being there aren't enough facilities in place that can recycle this material. Uh, it's, it's not like typical plastic. It's, it's, as I said, it's a mixture of, it's a commingling of, of resins. Also, if I could just add one other piece about the plastic pots is they are typically made up of recycled material. They are typically made up of, uh, a mixture of resins which mm -hmm. cannot be identified at the recycling facility so so you're saying they're, they've when, already been recycled and uh, if you know anything about plastic recycling it, it only has one or two generations before yeah, it becomes right. pretty much useless yes be, or be, too because to of too brittle um, and you know the Sun does, wreaks havoc on them uh, and so those two reasons alone uh, account for a, f a huge amount of the plastic pots that are not being recycled. So, as you can imagine, I sort of go, th I, I, I sort of experience PTSD every time I go to a, a wholesaler now because all I see are these is black plastic. It's everywhere. It's absolutely everywhere. And, and tell us so, how how many of these pots end up back or end up in landfills. Approximately nine, between 95 and 98 percent. Um, my response to that. Even. <laughs> that you have that, all these fun toys I don't have access to. This yeah. Is not fair. <laughs> so, so, Marie, the 95 to 98 percent wind up in landfills, but probably a lot of people who are trying to recycle them don't even know that because, as you say, in good faith, they're bringing them to a facility. Homeowners might be putting it in their own recycle bins and just not realizing that it's falling apart in, in the process. Right. They do not realize. Um, and that, that, well, so when I first started researching this paper, uh, I had no idea what I was about to, to face, Uncover. so to speak. <laughs> yes. Um, it, it was surreal to me that this material in particular, that the answer the problem slash the answer ended up being a recycling issue. So um, it, it was jaw dropping and it was also an eye opener to all of us in this industry and, and people who just buy, uh, you know, they go and buy plants at, at the local nursery. Uh, the, these, these, it's not sustainable. It's not a sustainable practice at all. And well, it's, you it's know, like, if, if I may it, jump in here and just say, yep. this is, you were shocked by this, but I've known this for more than a decade. And and a lot of people like Beth Botts in Chicago were uh, writing mm -hmm. for the Tribune knew mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. Now, what we did not mm -hmm. know is that the problem would continue to be a problem well into the 21st century, that we and, would get to 2020. And get worse. And, As right, oil because we, you're right with oil, you know, and one of the things that Beth wrote about in her stories back in the mm -hmm. day was, well, the uh, oil prices are really high. 
Um, and, and you would say, well, that would encourage recycling. Um, the, now the oil prices are rock bottom. That's obviously yeah. not going to encourage recycling, which makes things even right. worse, doesn't it? Right. No, it most certainly does. Uh, the, the manufacturers, by and large, uh, are using virgin plastic, virgin uh, you know, oil, and mm -hmm. it's more expensive and it's more complicated, it's more cumbersome to recycle, to, to use recycled material. Uh, the virgin oil is also more easily accessed by the manufacturers and it's clean. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's no concern about what resins are in this material that you're receiving, uh, the feedstock. Yeah. The, the quality control is easier for them probably. Yes, uh, absolutely. Absolutely, but but that's the that the devil is in the details. That's part mm -hmm. of the problem is that we we just make more and more and more different kinds of plastic. Um, you mentioned earlier that the readers can't see black. Why haven't we created? Why haven't we invented things that can read that kind of material and process it properly? We don't. We're all we're stymied by recycling in this country in general. You know, when when China decides to put up its green wall mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. and refuse our plastics, we go, oh my goodness, what country are we going to ship it to now? Instead of saying, why are we not creating facilities in the United States as the richest country in the history of this planet? Why are we not or creating? Or not using as much plastic. Not even the Be facility. Because, Why are we using so much plastic? Yeah. Right. Well, plastic became a very famous material back during World War II. Mm -hmm. I mean, and it, and it hasn't stopped. I no. mean, it has, the, the production has grown exponentially over the past well, what, even, even 50 years. What about alternatives to plastic for, for large so scale APL, board industry and not home growers? Yep. So this is something that I've, I've been putting a lot of effort into. Uh, APLD has a campaign running right now. Uh, we have named it Healthy Pots, Healthy Planet, uh, where we are, we are trying to draw the attention to different to designers across the country of seeking out alternative material for the pots. Now, that's that's on the on the um, resource side. Mm -hmm. What I have what I have discovered is there are some manufacturers that are preemptively uh, grabbing this market. They're they're grabbing the alternatives material market, and they are creating fiber based pots. Uh, some which are they're known as bioplastics. So uh, bioplastics are a combination of biopolymers and in some instances petro, but not necessarily. Uh, and what I have done is I'm in touch with these people and we are, we are finding out who is selling or who is, who is growing and selling these plants in these pots so that people like me know where to source alternative pots, the fiber, in this case, fiber-based pots. Mm -hmm. So alternative pots have been in the industry for years, but mainly, mainly on the, the small consumer level. Yeah, and, and sort of on an yeah. experimental basis. And, exactly. And the, exactly. Uh, or, or boutique almost. The, yeah, yes. and the, the goal yes. has always been, oh, we'll have a plantable pot and it will decompose and you will be, but that never works. I mean, you've done this, Marie. A lot of times, those those pots do not decompose, and now you've got this these roots grown in this little ball. Um, well, and sometimes they, they well, a lot of times they do decompose, Mike, and that's one of the problems that the manufacturers and the growers have is how what is the how long is this pot going to last? from the mm -hmm. time that we put it in this pot to the time that it gets, gets to the consumer. Yeah. Uh, that the integrity of the pot is lost. So yeah. the, the issue is on a large scale. And also if you think about from an operations perspective uh, of the manufacturers, they need pots that they can uh, manufacture on potentially existing equipment, if not on new equipment, 
but they need to have, so I, I have an example here of a fiber-based pot that, as you can see, has a lip on it. Uh, the mm -hmm. lip, I'm hold, learning, hold, hold it a little higher, so, uh, so we, there we go. Look at that. Okay. Yeah. So this is a fiber-based pot, um, and it's, 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 it's very well, it's durable. It's quite durable. But when you're, when you're coming from the operations perspective, you, you need that lip to pick them up and, you know, manufacture them on a, la on a large scale. So it comes down to the, also the issue of design. But um, these pots are being manufactured. They are being created. And what we as, are, as designers are trying to do is to say, we are demanding alternative material. We are seeking out alternative material. And we're sharing this with our clients. We're educating mm -hmm. our clients saying, look, this is a much better pot for our planet than this piece of plastic. And it's, I was thinking earlier, it's, you know, you could view this issue as either a ray where you have uh, different, you know, you have the problem, you have the manufacturer, you have the consumer, you have the grower, you have the vendor, but this is actually a web. If you think of it as a web, it's everything is mm -hmm. integrated. So if we can get the message to the growers who up to this point, understandably, have been quite reluctant to use alternative material for, for plant, you know, for putting their plants into. Yeah. Um, I just want to let know, they have that. Go ahead. Oh, no, no, no. You, you finish and then I will jump in. No, I, I was just going to say, I mean, it's it's a multi it's a multi tiered problem, um, but mm -hmm. growers typically are not comfortable, you know, uh, having their plants put in these pots and, and stuck on a truck and sent across the country only to have them fall apart. So the confidence that they have had over the years uh, is, is very little, is very little. And if I were a person growing, pot, growing plants and having to use pots, sure, the default plastic makes, makes sense to me. Yeah, that's Marie Chiepo, for those of you listening on the podcast, um, from EcoPlant Plans. Uh, that's EcoPlantPlans.com, right? Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, but Absolutely. I want you to go to my website, MikeNovak.net, because, first of all, I want you to click on the report and read the entire report. It's not that long, uh, but it is comprehensive. Uh, mm -hmm. There's a PDF of it that I that, I've, that I've, I've posted a couple of times to make sure people see, yeah. see the link. And I, I've I put it up in, uh, in social here too. Oh, great! Um, and and I want to. This is a battle that you know we're we're salmon swimming upstream here, uh, mm -hmm. trying to fight the plastics industry, uh, mm -hmm. and and not just the industry, but the, how versatile plastic is. It is also killing us. That's the problem. It's versatile and it's killing us. You know, so which is going to win here? Um, we have our friend uh, Wilco Green here who's been in the recycling business uh, for a long time. Uh, she's watching the program this morning, and she has a couple of comments. She says, um, okay. the advantage of black is it allows all colors of plastic to be used, but it is very difficult to sort and market black plastics, as we said. Uh, one of the mm -hmm. issues that I have and that you probably have too, Marie, is that each company wants to do its own. Uh, marketing and the colors of their own uh, 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 pots and it's um, uh, the, the more specialized you get the harder it becomes to sort all that plastic and, and bring it all together and uh, the other thing she says plastic is cheap it is lightweight and difficult to compete yep. against and yep. this is this yep. is what we're up against um, so this is light <laughs> it is <laughs> yep and if I, if I can just add uh, it has been shown time and time again that consumers are willing to pay a bit more for something that is going to benefit the environment versus something like the plastic bags. As I said to you before, I wish we had a David Attenborough for the plastic pots issue. It's a single-use <laughs> plastic that is just tossed and ends up you know, degrading in the environment. Um, we're running out of time here, but the other thing I want to call attention to is something you do mention in your white paper, uh, mm -hmm. and that is extended producer responsibility, EPR. Uh, I'm a firm believer in that, and somehow, at some point, if, if 
the market doesn't, you know, we always say, well, the market will take care of things. It'll, it'll, it'll adjust everything. And my feeling is, it, well, if the market isn't working and it's not, it, because this is stretching back, as I've shown, 12, 13 yes. years yep. we've been dealing with yep. this, uh, yep. then, then the government has to get involved. And maybe we have to legislate uh, some responsibility on the mar part of the producers to reclaim the plastic or figure out what to do with it, because we don't the know what The plastics industry is, is the producers. Yeah, I mean. yeah. The plastic. Right, well... And, and I think that's one of, one of the, one of the large, um, the impetus for one company in particular is, is jumping ahead of that, is uh, saying, look, this is what's going to end up happening. We need to start producing alternative types of pots. Uh, and, and also, uh, this company has said they plan to and they want to work with legislators. Uh, these, these, these pot manufacturers are anticipating all of this. There's currently uh, an act that has been put together. It's called the Recover Act uh, that various states are working together on for uh, the EPR on plastic packaging. Technically, POTS are, is, is considered packaging. It's something that is used within the year that is in which it is produced. So if we can get these lined up with other types of packaging, that would be wonderful. Yeah, that would be wonderful. Yeah. Well, uh, I w yeah, that that is one way to go, and I think we we need to, to continue to look for solutions. Uh, I because we can't uh, in the in the past we would say, oh, uh, it's up to the gardener. Please return your your plastics, but it doesn't go anywhere. It ends up in a landfill anyway, doesn't it? And there's no market for it. Yes, there's no there is no market for it. I, I, the, so there is a sunny side starting the sun is starting to appear over the horizon a little bit in the recycling market there are companies that are now looking to re recover and recycle plastic so there there is a market for this and it's going to take time well it's, it's starting yeah one of the mm -hmm. the the wraps on uh going the recycling route is people say oh the market's tanked well guess what markets fluctuate they go up they go down recycling is yep. no different some it, you know in, in in three years you're going to look and, and recycling is going to be booming again who knows uh, it's hard to predict what's going to happen so you can't just give up on um uh, on recycling you you have to like you have to nurture it like you nurture anything uh in the world right and 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 if i could just quickly add we we do we also are following the model of reduce uh reuse and recycle so one consideration we are we are taking is can these designers can these people reuse one another's pots is is there a way that we can re return them to the 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 wholesaler or the the you know whomever we buy our purchase our plants from and say hey can you reuse these or to the grower can you reuse these yeah it's another option it's it's another you know well, potential uh, answer to this the point here if you read this uh, report uh there are no easy answers there's there's no yeah. no silver bullet right now that's going to cure this problem we need to work on it because it continues to be a problem and as you know microplastics are ending up uh, all over the planet we're ingesting them uh wildlife is ingesting them wildlife is yeah. being killed by i mean you know it's all the air you know everything. the drill plastics are everywhere absolutely absolutely and, and uh it's not good enough to say well it really works for the industry so we have to keep using the same um no that's not uh an excuse it, it doesn't fly no uh, and we're getting the word out and good. I'm glad to hear. Here, we're going to have you back, Marie. Uh, this is uh, too. I hope so. It's too important a topic, uh, and nobody talks about this. You know, it, it, even when I talk to my recycling friends, they don't mention this part of the recycling problem. They don't mention no. the horticultural industry. No. Who and and what we do is we our aim is to beautify and improve the environment, to make mm -hmm. a healthier you know be good stewards of the land. Right. Yeah. Right. And, and and we introduce this plastic, and it sort of is goes against what we're yeah. our, what our goals are. Yeah, it absolutely is. All right, Marie Chiapo, thank you so much for being with us. Thank I, you, Mike and Peggy. It was uh, a pleasure. Go to my website. Go take a look at the report. She did very comprehensive, uh, and like I said, it's not not a a long read, but it is an important read. And uh, we'll have you yes. uh, back on the show as soon as we can. Okay. 
with great updates. Okay. All right. Thanks, it, Marie. Uh, it's Thank the, you. It's the Mike Novak Show with Peggy Malecki. We're talking bees when we come back. You can help slow climate change in 2021 by composting. And you don't even need a backyard. By composting communally in multi-unit buildings across Chicagoland, Collective Resource Compost has diverted 7,000 tons of food scraps since 2010. CRC brings you a fresh 5-gallon bucket or a 32-gallon neighbor tote with each pickup. You fill it with organic matter, they swap it out, and get it to a commercial composting operation. Fight climate change. Go to collectiveresource.us. At Sitka Salmon Shares, we take pride in being a seafood company that's a little different. In fact, 10 seasons ago, our motto was we do salmon differently. Nowadays, we harvest 15 species of wild-caught Alaskan fish, but still call ourselves Sitka Salmon Shares because, well, we're a little different. Our difference starts with our fleet of fishermen who own a slice of the company Mm. and are paid above industry average. They deliver fish to our docks in about half the time as other fishermen, which means higher quality of fish for you. And we never buy our fish from large processors where we don't know how each fish was caught or handled, like most other companies do. Another difference is our fish plant, which we own too. Our plant freezes fish about twice as cold and twice as fast as the other guys. This produces unparalleled quality at a cellular level. Ooh. Our difference extends to you too. By joining our community, you band together with thousands of other people who want to make a difference in the way that their food is produced. This allows our fishermen to harvest fish just for you, with the respect, thought, and care that the fish, the ocean, and you deserve. So, be a little different. Join us at SitkaSalmonShares.com. At this time of year, we spend a lot of time indoors with our plants, so help them thrive. The plants you're viewing were treated with Leafzyme, a foliage spray designed to activate beneficial microbes already present on the leaves. A spritz every few weeks promotes growth-enhancing microorganisms that process dust and other particles into nutrition that indoor plants can absorb through their leaves for beautiful and vigorous growth. Go to blazing-star.com and check out their BioGarden line for home gardeners. And just before we get to our beekeepers, Peggy has got some information for you. I do. Yeah. The 10th annual One Earth Film Festival is now underway and runs through next Sunday, March 14th. You know all that information. I can handle it. Today's trailer is the infuriating story of an environmental crisis that did not need to happen. The film Flint examines the poisoning of the public water in a city populated primarily by people of color, and it's about their fight for justice. Flint, Michigan, the very first GM car. Lion's assembly plant. This city was the Silicon Valley. The 50 million General Motors car. Of the day. There's a certain toughness, and you root for Flint. It has been five decades since Flint used the river for drinking water. Today, they open up the gates to start that process again. Countdown. Three, two, one. Here's the Flint. Flint. The Flint River has been a dumping site for a hundred years. The thought that we would actually be drinking this. There's nothing more fundamental to your life than water. For that to be what can actually hurt you, cripple you, or kill you, is something that you could never get over. That's enough lead to cause lead poisoning in more than 3,000 children. We have just altered the life course trajectory of an entire generation of Flint children. Governor Snyder, I wonder why the people of Flint should trust you. Filtered water has been determined to be safe for people to drink. This is a crime scene. Mark Ruffalo, 
you only find in water what you look for. You got a lot more contaminants in this water than what you're being told about. Scott was uh, brought on as our chief scientist. Bathroom, shower, air testing underway. Flint water crisis. This certified lab I use is really where the science is. These folks are dangerous. I do not trust any of them. This defines a dark age. We live in a dark age. It's defined by not knowing who you can trust in a society that runs on trust. I'm not gonna allow anybody to spin this against me ever again. And the first fully virtual One Earth Film Festival runs th through the 14th of March. Unless otherwise indicated, all films are free with a suggested $8 donation. For more information, go to oneearthfilmfest.org. The One Earth Film Festival, 10 years of inspiring change. And boy, anytime you can get Mark Ruffalo uh, <laughs> involved, that's a good thing. The other thing that I've noticed is that uh, if you get the British reporters in there, um, mm -hmm. You know, and they're the ones that are going to ask the tough questions. Uh, <laughs> Governor Snyder, is there any reason we should trust you at all? And you just go, oh, okay. Yeah, they're actually asking a straightforward question. This is really good. Uh, let's bring our guests here. Um, and thank you for, for being patient and uh, working with us. Look on the right is my, my friend, Kaida Muhammad, uh, and she as you can see is from the Ash Park Advisory Council. It's uh, the Ash uh, Park Beach Advisory Council on the south side of Chicago. Uh, on the left is Jana Kinsman. She is the founder and chief biker at uh, Bike a Bee. Um, that's right. Let's give uh, let's give them both a ding here. Um, and um, uh, I'm going to start with you, Kaida, because you 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 contacted me at the end of last year, uh, and you would. You were writing about your hippie astrums there, um, or hippie asters, as you call them. Uh, and you have a beautiful plant. Uh, you've got a couple of plants there uh, on, on your left, don't you? This one here is not blossoming yet. I'm going to have to open up. So. It'll get there. This one surprised me. It surprised you? Yeah. I thought it was bewitched. Yeah, that's email. You and why are they blooming this time of year? I'm used to them being with me around November and December. Ah, and gone by now. Yeah. Well, I never get mine till this time of year because I never bring them in early enough. So, uh, uh, but again, it's not an amaryllis, even though you think it is. It's a hippie astrum or a hippie aster, however you want to call it. Uh, so anyway, uh, uh, you contacted me and said. You were talking about that, and then you said, "Oh yeah." And then I'm going to go out and uh, and uh, take pictures, uh, heat pictures of my beehive. And I thought I didn't know you had a beehive, and I didn't know you were you were doing that. Um, tell me about the hive. Where's it located, and and how long have you been uh, attending it? Well, I've been attending that particular hive in the back of the yard so since last summer. Um, I was uh, um, asked to managed it and uh and i had to reach out to jean a couple of other people it was um an issue that was really challenging for me i i am a hobbyist the beekeeping is a hobby for me but i take it serious enough to reach out to people with more experience and knowledge than me when i recognize that there's something uh wrong that i don't readily understand uh, well, that and and that was the case. Uh, I said you have to uh, you have to be on the show, and uh, you said, "Well, I'm 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 not an expert." And I said, "Well, let's we'll we'll get an expert here." And and I had been reading about Bike B for some time, and it was one of those uh, uh, companies uh, I had seen information on various times, and I thought this is really interesting. I want to have this person or have this this group of people on my show. It turns out it is a person, although you have you have some help, Jan, Jana Kinsman, don't you? Yeah, I, I have apprenticeships during the year. So I get people who 
get to learn a full year of beekeeping while also lending me a second pair of hands for the really heavy stuff. Uh, so tell me about the origin of Bike a Bee and how, how does your company work? Yeah, um, the origin was uh, I had taken a beekeeping class with the Chicago Honey Co-op here in Chicago um, in 2011 and I just fell in love with the idea of beekeeping and I went out to Eugene, Oregon and worked with a beekeeper out there through, you know, the woofing website, Worldwide Opportunities on Organic Farms. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. It was, it was I, I have a friend, I have a friend who was a, a woofer and went uh, uh, to Europe to do it. Yeah, that's, uh, I don't know if I get to, I'll get to do that maybe later in life, but it seems like a great opportunity. I mean, I love working hard and money is kind of a middleman for the sort of things that you get doing woofing. So I loved opting out of the money system and instead just getting to work with bees and, you know, get food and place to sleep. It was awesome. But anyways, yeah, I mean, I was out there working with this guy and he kept bees in different, you know, locations throughout Eugene in like a blueberry farm, somebody's backyard, a community garden and he would drive around in his truck all day visiting them and I would joke with him that I want to do the same thing in Chicago but on a bicycle because I didn't have a car and I also loved proving that you can do anything by bike so after my apprenticeship out there I came back to Chicago and I put together a Kickstarter campaign and raised enough money to start 10 hives Mm -hmm. And that was in 2012, and I've been beekeeping since, and I've been doing it by bicycle. And now I take care of about 40 hives, mostly on the south side, some on the west side, and it's still by bike. That is just uh, fantastic. And and yeah, and it, how I found out about you uh, this year was I saw the notice for you were looking for the interns, and by the time I contacted you, I said, well maybe we can help get the word out. But by that time you had a dozen or two dozen people already lined up. So I just said, well then let's just talk on the show uh, with you and uh, Kaida because uh, uh, um, you've worked with her a little bit, haven't you? Yeah. I visited her hive that she cares for in back of the yards once. And then we will talk to each other in text when we want to ask questions about technique. Okay. Well, I want to pop up if I can uh, do this here. Hold on. Let's find. Uh, I got to move a little faster here. Here we go. Let's pop up a photo. I don't know if you can see that, Kaida, but that is that the the hive. Yes, it is. That's there, it. There, there, there. You go, and um, and you actually. This is with. Uh, a group called Let Us Breathe Collective. Um, it's called the Breathing Room Space uh, for Let Us Breathe Collective in, in the back of the yard. How many, is there just the one hive? Right now, yes, only one hive. Okay. And uh, I'm going to assume this is you? That's me before <laughs> I reached out to Jana. <laughs> oh, before you reached out to... Jana? Yeah, yeah, that was that was the time I was kind of uh, battling with, and the colony was real mean. <laughs> uh, Jana, what what kind of help were you able to provide for uh, Kaida? Well, Kaida inherited these hives from somebody who started these beehives and then essentially abandoned them, and. A lot of beginner beekeepers will begin beekeeping um, doing this technique called foundationless beekeeping, which is what you see here where the bees are just given an empty frame that has no foundation in it, and then they build their comb freeform, which is what they do in the wild. Um, but it's an advanced beekeeping technique. You kind of have to understand the principles of how bees build their colony. And so this guy who abandoned the hives just kind of didn't properly spaced the frames and so the bees built comb all over the place and it just wasn't going to work out in the long term. So we 
what we did was we transferred the bees to frames with foundation, some that had comb already built on the foundation, um, and then just kind of cleaned up the wax and the honey from there to make it, because the whole point of using a beehive that looks like that is that you can take it apart and inspect it and make sure that the hive is healthy. So if you can't manipulate the frames because they're all stuck together with comb that's kind of weaving in and out, then there's like no point. So it just was kind of really messy. And you know, the longer you have a beehive open and the longer you're manipulating the frames, the, the, the more the bees notice and so then they can become pretty feisty because you're leaving them exposed to the elements. Um, so it was better to do that with two people than just one. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, yeah I, I can imagine. And somebody like uh, Kaida, like you, Kaida, you're you're new to this and trying to uh, to uh, help this colony get through. Um, it can be kind of difficult. And speaking of helping colonies get through, uh, you sent me this photo too. <laughs> This is uh, just a couple of weeks ago. Uh, this is where the you were trying to get to the hive by shoveling the walk to the hive. Is that was what you were doing, Kaida? Yes. So you couldn't even That's get. That's what I was trying to do. There was there was no way to open the given after that clearing. That clearance there didn't allow me to open the gate. So mm -hmm. I tried to do a thermal imaging from the sidewalk, and it didn't work that well. Oh, <laughs> oh no! Oh my gosh! I mean, talk and, and what was the point of the thermal imaging? Well, it kind of gives you an idea of the situation inside of the hive. It um, you can see the cluster, and it lets you know that the yeah that's it. You can see the cluster, and it lets you know that the bees are in that cluster. They're they're making heat. They're warm. It was a very small colony. Yeah. Um, so that so the cluster where the right. bees are is where the red is showing, correct? Yeah, and that's them generating heat to keep themselves warm. Some of the bees are on the outside, and they take turns going in and outside of that circle-like uh, pattern uh, to stay warm. And the queen is in there, so. Wow, that's yeah. and this that's is the regular thermography that that you're doing on it. Yes. It's a FLIR-1 camera. You can uh, do thermal imaging. Uh, mm with the uh, homes to see people get beehives inside the walls of their house and so uh, a thermal camp for uh, looking for those images and seeing exactly where a colony is located inside of your wall what well for an amateur that seems pretty sophisticated to go out and get a camera like that and uh, take those photos I, I I I was uh, I find it intriguing, uh, Mike. You know, bees rock, so you have to you know <laughs> give them the, the best of the best, and that's what I do. Yeah. So. <laughs> uh, do you, uh, uh, Jana? Do you use this, that sort of thermal imaging as well? No, I wanted one of them for a long time, <laughs> and I. It's like on my list of like when I have extra cash, this is something I should get, but. <clears throat> It's just not not a priority, I guess. And you know, a lot of my I have forty hives that are spread over like, you know, thirteen different locations and mm -hmm. so it's a lot harder to go and visit all of them. But you know, now that I own a house and I have a vacant lot next door, as soon as I'm able to like get hives at my house, it's it would be much more fun that, you know, I could go and visit them in the winter a lot easier. What mm -hmm. are um what kind of restrictions are there in the city of Chicago for starting a hive for anybody who wants to uh, to do this? Uh, let's Jana, let's start with you. Yeah, you can have up to five hives per city lot, and that's the only restriction there is in Chicago. I mean, I would recommend anybody take a class and get a really good sense of how to care for hives, especially you know in the city where it's a dense urban environment. Um, we're lucky in Chicago, we don't have any rules that require us to ask our neighbors if they're okay mm -hmm. with us having bees and stuff. Um, so it's kind of, I don't know, I love Chicago's 
uh, beekeeping rules. It's much less restrictive than some of the yeah. nearby suburbs. It's a pretty amazing, isn't it? Yeah, because we've we've talked about this in, in, on the show before, and in some suburbs, uh, you get one person complain, and then the the city council just kind of comes down like a ton of bricks on the whole operation, and then you suddenly you can't do beekeeping anymore. Yeah. And, and Chicago, I mean, in Chicago is kind of the same way with chickens as well, with uh, you know livestock. Um, certain kinds uh, of things. So I'm glad to hear that. Um, as a beginning beekeeper, Kaida, now that you've had a little experience, uh, what would you do differently starting over uh, from what what you did uh, uh, to get going? Well, I would uh, avoid using any kind of uh, lemongrass in my feeder for the bee hive because it to attract robbers or bees from other uh, apiaries in the area, as well as yellow jackets. I, mm -hmm. I will definitely refrain from using that. Uh, robbing was a major issue for me and the colony that I was uh, taking care of. And really? I, I did not, it, it, it was really bad. Well, let's uh, let's That's go. Why there were only two frames in there. They they rob, and then sometimes the, some of the colony might leave and go with the robbers. Uh, they're they're <laughs> different things. Bees have a personality that's uh, quite interesting. <laughs> uh, Jana, tell us a little bit about that. What is the issue that uh, uh, Kaida is referring to? Have you had this? Yeah, robbing is common in late summer. Um, when there's a dearth of nectar resources in the environment, um, which usually after July, there becomes less and less forage for the bees. Um, mm -hmm. Our biggest nectar resource are the linden trees and they stop blooming mid-June. Um, so after that, the nectar resources start going down and then the yellow jacket population starts going up. And it just becomes much more difficult for beekeepers. And if you have a smaller colony like Kaida has, um, it's harder for a smaller colony to defend their entrance. Um, if you have a, a big, strong colony, they can defend their entrance pretty well against robbers. But yeah, it's, I mean, some years, one year when the yellow jacket population exploded for reasons I don't know, I think we had a really mild winter or something. Um, I remember just like, I think I lost like, I don't know, a quarter of my colonies that were weaker to yellow jackets. And it just was, it was the worst feeling in the world. And I kept praying and praying for like a hard frost to come in October. <laughs> but it like, that was like the summer just lasted till December that year. It was terrible. Wow. Um, uh, speaking of that, uh, and we only have a couple of minutes here, um, how, well have your hives uh, survived uh, are you experiencing the kinds of bee losses that uh, occur uh, on a, or have occurred on a large scale over the past 15 or 20 years in the united states and across the world jana yeah i mean i think it's pretty i don't think my whole group of hives fared very well this year we had such a long period of cold the bees need more like ups and downs throughout the winter where it's warmer mm -hmm. and then it gets really cold. They have to go outside the hive to poop. They don't poop inside the hive. And then if they do, they get sicker. So I tried to set them up as best I could this past summer so that they could succeed in the winter. But then I had some major personal events in the fall that prevented me from really helping them right before winter. And so it just wasn't a good winter all around for me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I understand. And of course, we were all dealing with COVID, dealing with the pandemic, uh, which takes me to the final question I want to uh, ask of uh, Kaida, because you also run, you started and you run the uh, Chicago South Shore Farmers Market. You did not have a market last year uh, because of, and by the way, uh, one of our uh, watchers said, you look like a bee because you've got antenna coming out of your head. It's your 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 lamp behind you. So... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> And she meant that in a very nice way. Yes, yeah, she, she did. So, yeah. That's, that's um, Audrey. Uh, but that's funny. 
And so, uh, how's the market? Is the market going to be back? Do you have any idea? Uh, we're planning to uh, launch the market this season. Yes, uh, we're not sure exactly of the start date, but we'll have that together by the end of March. Uh, th- I'm I'm glad to hear that, and I hope that uh, you're able to uh, reopen because uh, I know you've worked very hard. This is that's it's a labor of love, but it's it's a lot of work, isn't it? It is a lot of work. <laughs> we uh, we were talking the other day and kind of comparing different markets, and um, uh, you've uh, you've managed to keep that going for several years. And I hope that you're able to resume this year. Uh, and once the ah, if we can get away from this uh, pandemic stuff. So, uh, Kaida Maham, yes, Kaida. No, I was just going to say, our food chain relies uh, heavily on our uh, pollinators, particularly the honeybee. And uh, uh, I want your listeners to be aware of the fact that they're, they're social insects. They don't really attack you unless there's something going on in an environment that they're in. Uh, the yellow jackets are aggressive. They will attack you. That's the bee's cousin or a distant cousin, I should say. And uh, our food chain relies heavily on that. So, you know, having uh, beekeeping as a hobby and the first market kind of uh, uh, solidifies where or how I feel about that. And uh, one more and thing I- then. I'm glad you brought that up because uh, uh, the other thing I, w- I learned the other day, and I did not know this, uh, and Jana told me this, is that uh, you've got to be careful where you cite uh, a bee colony if it's near... Uh, uh, native plantings. Can you explain that a little bit? Yeah, there's been a lot of research lately about how honeybees, managed honeybee colonies can take away resources from native bee populations. So Mm -hmm. honeybees are Apis mellifera. They're from Eurasia and they were brought over with the um, colony colonizers. And the native populations that we have here like bumblebees and sweat bees and mason bees they all visit the same flowers but if there's an overabundance of honeybees they can they can potentially take away resources from the native bee populations which don't get as much celebrity notice and aren't supported by a billion dollar industry so it's kind of you got to be careful about that so that's that's interesting so uh if you're if you're uh planting a native garden uh Keep an eye out for where the the honeybee populations are in the area. That's uh, I had no idea. That's very very interesting stuff. Uh, Jana Kinsman and Kaida Muhammad, thank you so much. Um, and uh, if uh, Jana, if uh, I, I assume you work only on the south side, right? South and west side mostly. Yeah. Yeah. So folks want to get a hold of you. How do they do that? Uh, they can find me at bikeabee.com. All right. And I've got that link uh, on my website and Kaida. Uh, we're looking forward to the market and, and good luck on keeping those bees going uh, this year. We appreciate you being yeah, here. Yeah, good luck, Kaida. Thank you. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, we're going to take a break here, a quick break. And then when we come back, we're talking about the right to garden in Illinois. When I'm with an older tree you know, and there's just something about it that draws you to it. It's similar to the ocean, draws you to it. And when I see a big tree and I'm gonna climb it, I enjoy that moment and I'll give the tree a big old hug. My name's Chase Ferris. I work out of the Clackamas office just outside Portland, Oregon. I've been with Bartlett Tree Experts since October of 2016 and I'm a climber. I was kind of surprised and taken back by the, the quality of equipment and the amount of effort that goes into keeping everyone safe and keeping the jobs productive and making sure that you are progressing every day. And I enjoy that because I like to learn. I like the Raptor and we we use it quite a bit out on the West Coast. Our trees are pretty tall and the the Raptor is great for saving energy, allowing you to get into the canopy with minimal physical exertion so that you're fresh and ready to climb and do what you need to do, you know, when you're 65, 70 feet up or higher. So at my office, I feel like you could take just about anyone, put a crew together and send them out to a job and have it be successful. And that has to do with 
trusting the people you work with, feeling safe around them, and knowing their strengths and weaknesses. Every tree needs a champion. You have the ability to give your soil a superpower. It's called composting. If you don't have a backyard, you need to contact Collected Resource Compost. CRC has diverted 7,000 tons of food scraps since 2010. They bring you a fresh 5-gallon bucket or a 32-gallon neighbor tote with each pickup. You fill it with organic matter from your kitchen, they swap it out and get it to a commercial composting operation. Fight climate change. Go to CollectedResource.us. Welcome to the Mike Novak Show with Peggy Malecki. Green, gardening, and environment radio with just a soup-son of humor. Or is that a dash? Brought to you by Bartlett Tree Experts. Every tree needs a champion. Go to Bartlett.com. Here they are again, Peggy Malecki and Mike Novak. All I need is good food to eat and make me healthy, wealthy, wide awake. Lettuce, tomatoes, root, and bacon. What about those sweet potatoes? All I need is good food to eat. All I need is good food to eat. All I need is good tools to make me music, porches, lawn, serene. And welcome back to the Mike Novak Show with Peggy Malecki. Um, I think I'll let you, uh, can you, can you take this one, Peggy? Yep. The Evanston Environmental Association's Wild and Scenic Film Festival goes virtual this March, and you can be there from your home. This year's films include the story of the first African-American male to complete the triple crown of hiking, how church forests in Ethiopia protect the biodiversity of old-growth forests, and a community effort to keep an oil refinery closed after an explosion. Now, the festival happens from 6.30 to 9 p.m. on March 19th and March 26th, and tickets are available starting at just $10. Now, all proceeds from the festival support the operations and programming of the Evanston Ecology Center. So for more info and to register, visit evanstonenvironment.org slash filmfest. Environment. All right. Welcome back uh, to the show. Let's uh, bring in our guests uh, right away. And um, um, you're going to recognize the, the woman on the lower left as Nicole Virgil, who has been on this show too many times um you know i was just here in october i'm i'm sick of seeing you here nicole i, I want this to, i want this to end oh, but, um, or no sick of seeing her in this context of still fighting in, the same fight in this context We're not sick of seeing you, nicole. what what no not at all i think people understand what i'm talking about which is uh to say i would love to have you on the show so we could just talk about what you're growing you know, and you yeah. could give, you could give advice to people, which is what you would rather do, I'm sure, than spend your time in Springfield lobbying to get a bill passed so that you have a right to grow vegetables in your uh, uh, in your own backyard. You know, it's it just seems crazy, but here we are in 2021, and it's a new year, and you're still fighting the city of Elmhurst to uh, let you put up a hoop house in your backyard uh this is now uh going into its what fifth or sixth year uh it's it's been a while hasn't it it has been a while this is our third time at bat with the state legislation but it all started back in 2015 so it's 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 been a few years holy but, smoke uh, yeah you'll be going wow. yeah at some point this year it'll be six years uh, uh on your, this. Your, your kids are going yeah. to think this is just an ongoing thing they they already do. <laughs> yeah. It's just part of living in our house, I guess. So. Uh, and but, and for those uh, folks who who don't know the story, uh, Nicole put up a, a hoop house in her backyard back in 2015, and uh, after somebody complained about it apparently uh, the city came and said you need to take this down uh and they said but we're not really violating any of the laws here and uh we we only keep it up in the winter so we can extend the growing season uh and uh and the city said no and then nicole found out there were other structures very much like that in the city of elmhurst but they got to stay up um and so uh, but the city still said no, and so you said, okay, enough of this. After fighting a battle for a while, you said, I'll go to the state legislature. I'll go to the General Assembly. We'll pass a law, and we'll just override the city of Elmhurst. Um, 
which makes a lot of other municipalities nervous because they would rather not have to do this uh, and deal with it. And and uh, and but there you are. Unfortunately, that law has not passed yet. And because we ended the last legislative session, we have a new one. So you have to reintroduce the bills this year. And you have, but uh, from what you told me, oh, and, and, and I should add, because we got that guy on the right there, um, uh, is uh, you're getting more help all the time. There are a lot of organizations in the state of Illinois who support what you're doing. There's a lot of people who support what you're doing. There are now uh, a bunch of legislators who support what you're doing. And now you have people like um, Ari, and, and I forget, is it a soft G or a hard G, Ari? It is a hard G. Bargill, Bargill, um, because uh, I, I, I know we talked about it, and, and in the midst of time, I lost track of it. Uh, Ari Bargill from uh, the, uh, um, the, uh, the Institute for Justice, he's an attorney, and the Institute for Justice has gotten on board as well. Uh, so let's start, Ari, we'll get to you in a second, but let's start, Nicole, with what you're learning uh, in Springfield about your support and, and where the newly introduced bills are going. Yeah, so uh, we filed the bills both in the House and in the Senate. Uh, the Senate bill has been placed in the Local Government Committee, and the House bill has been placed in the Agriculture and Conservation Committee. Uh, that's a good placement for us because the chief sponsor for the House bill, Sonia, Representative Sonia Harper, is the chairman of the Agriculture Committee. And so we're looking forward to having hopefully some success there, as well as in the Local Government Committee, as uh, it's, it frequently takes time for legislators to become familiar with what it is you're trying to do. It's, it's very, very common for bills to take multiple years to pass because there's thousands of bills presented every sure. session. So that's not unusual, nor should we be, should anyone be discouraged by that. But now that it's been the third year, uh, we've, we've made the rounds, you know, multiple years. A lot of legislators know who I am. They know the story. They understand that municipal governments are uh, tilting towards tyranny, let's say, and not necessarily applying the laws equally to their residents. So uh, state legislators at this point are, are uh, it looks like they're leaning towards protecting um, all, all, the, all the Illinois residents' rights to grow food on their own property, which of course the state protects rights in a variety of ways. So this is not unusual or atypical. I, I like your idea of taxation without, I'm thinking taxation without rutabagas is tyranny. Um, we, we'll, we'll come up with a phrase that, that kind of works there. By the way, the bills are, uh, House bill is 633, Senate bill is 170, um, Senator David Kaler is, is uh, the sponsor of the Senate bill, and he's also been behind you uh, for a while. Yes, he has. Um, in fact, uh, I've seen, you can go, uh, I've got links to various places where you can see the story, including your YouTube page. Uh, you've got a Facebook page, you've got a website, and uh, there's interviews with, with the senator and with other people uh, about this. So from what I understand, what you told me, uh, you've gotten a, uh, you're getting a little more support now. Have you gotten other legislators on board? What how, what is the prognosis for the, this legislative session? Well, we have more support now than we've ever had before, so that's good. Mm -hmm. And like I said, you know, it does take a few sessions to get people familiar with your story. Um, there's some familiarity now, as people have been talking about it for a while, so there's a lot of legislators who uh, are like, oh, yeah, I remember that story. That still isn't resolved yet? You mean the, the city <laughs> government's still discriminating <laughs> against your right to grow food? Oh, so perhaps maybe there is a need to to get behind this. So, uh, yeah, the 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 momentum is growing, and um, I, I don't think you can guarantee a win, but we're in a good position. All right, which takes us to uh, Ari, and uh, you got on board. How did the Institute for Justice get on board uh, with this fight? It's hard to remember at this stage, uh, but uh, we got on board. I think originally after Nicole gave us a call, 
um, and told us what was going on after I think she recognized that we were a group that had been uh, involved in a very, very similar effort, um, successful effort mm -hmm. down here in Florida, which is where I am. Um, and that's something that began years ago as well. Um, we actually were involved in a lawsuit uh, on behalf of a couple in Miami Shores, Florida, who wanted to grow vegetables in their front yard. This might uh, sound familiar to some of your listeners who are more plugged into the movement on a national level. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, believe it or not, a court in Florida concluded that you do not have a constitutional right to grow your own food on your own property. Um, and so we therefore then shifted our efforts to the legislature. We were successful. We got the, the Right to Garden Act passed in Florida. And I think around that time is when Nicole reached out to us. Um, and when I heard about what uh, was happening to Nicole and all of the difficulty that she was having both in Springfield and in Elmhurst, um, it's kind of a no brainer for us. This falls really right within, um, you know, a number of the practice areas that we, that we work within, um, notably sort of the uh, intersection between property rights and food freedom. Um, and this, mm -hmm. you know, definitely touched on the general uh, notion of self-sufficiency, which is something we also care a lot about. So, you know, to, to step in and to be able to work with Nicole is certainly a, an awesome opportunity, um, but it, it also helps us to deliver the message of the importance of property rights to people uh, throughout the country, because if, if you don't have the right to grow your own food on your own property, then what do you actually have the right to do? It should seem so fundamental and second nature to most people um, that in America, you ought to be able to grow your own food on your own property. And believe it or not, it's exceedingly difficult in many, many places. And that's uh, why we're here. Yeah. Uh, I'm that, uh, Supreme court decision in Florida makes me wonder what, what rights do you have? Uh, mm -hmm. because <laughs> one, there seems to be this, this, uh, idea in the United States, uh, you know, the rugged individualist, if you own property, you could do any darn thing you want with it, except then you get smacked down for doing, doing, keeping yourself alive, you know, providing yourself with food. That, that seems odd. Would they give you the right to grow a lawn? Is, is, is that a given right? Do you have any idea? I mean, it's, it, as I've yeah. said before on the show, a lot of municipalities are really okay with lawns and chemicals that go on lawns. You can't, in fact, you probably know this, Ari, that uh, there are preemptive laws uh, regarding pesticides in, I believe, most of the states of the United States where you cannot, as a municipality, have a law that is stricter than the state law. And the chemical companies did this in the 90s so that they could, that these individuals, uh, municipalities could not pass anti-pesticide laws. So, in a way, we've gotten to the point where it's okay to throw down chemicals that can put your dog and your kids and uh, your neighbors at risk, but you can't grow vegetables to feed them, uh, which that seems a little weird, doesn't it? Well, it seems weird. It's unfortunate that if you know, if you want to, if you want to find hypocrisy in our in our legislative uh, <laughs> systems, you don't have to look very hard. But what you what you've touched on actually is a really important point when you talk about the idea of you know rugged individualism and if you have property, you can do any any darn thing you want. I mean, if you ask any normal person, um, what does it mean to have property and and what is sort of the the core right associated with having property? Um, at a minimum. Before we talk about, you know, large scale industrial uses, you should be able to grow food on it to provide for yourself and, and for your family. It is probably the, the most primary and, and fundamental uh, right mm -hmm. associated with, with property. And that's what's being trampled on at the local level, while at the same time, of course, as you mentioned, um, you know, municipalities are not only making it harder for, uh, I should say, uh, state legislators are not only making it harder for municipalities to regulate things that are harmful, um, they're empowering them to go out of their way in some instances to, um, to, to regulate things that are helpful. Um, mm -hmm. And that's what's problematic about a prohibition on growing food. Um, it just, it, yeah. it, it turns the idea of property rights on its head. And, you know, it, this is also a matter of environmental conscientiousness too. Um, there, sh there really shouldn't be any barrier to people who want to engage in the harmless, peaceful and productive use of property. And that's precisely what growing food is. Yeah. Now, you guys have a great graphic on your Facebook page, which is Right to Garden. And just to, to, to summarize for people who haven't necessarily seen it, because it's, it's a, just a good overview of both the state bill and the house bill, that three things you're trying to do. Prevent municipalities from banning vegetable gardens. 
protect the right to grow vegetables, including herbs, fruits, flowers, pollinator plants, and other edible plants. And also, for Nicole here, in your Elmhurst issues, requires municipalities to regulate gardening structures equally to other legal structures. And, uh, and I thought this was just a really good summary that you guys created. Well, and I and I and you also have what the bill will not do mm -hmm. on that graphic, which is prevent municipalities from enforcing ordinances related to height setback, water use, fertilizer use, or control of invasive or unlawful species. Override the rulemaking authority of uh, HOAs or impair the enforceability. I mean, God forbid we should override HOAs uh, or impair the enforceability of similar restrictive covenants. Uh, it will also not allow the growth or sale of illegal substances, including marijuana. Um, so it's it's laid out pretty clearly. It seems like it's um, it's it seems rather benign. Uh, if you ask me. Um, so, uh, Ari, what I would ask you is, what is it that the Institute for Justice uh, can do to help in this battle? What What is it you're doing in terms of trying to get this bill passed? Well, we're working with Nicole in a couple of different capacities. I mean, primarily what we can do um, is assist with the actual drafting process. We've worked in this area before, um, we've gotten a bill passed in this area before, the first of its kind in Florida. Illinois would be the second state in America to adopt mm -hmm. this act. And we'd like to, we'd like to um, you know, expand upon that uh, if we're successful here, for sure, in other states. Um, and, you know, what you just rattled off, the, the, what seems pretty benign, that's, that's a reflection of, you know, the, the research that we've put in to make sure uh, we're accounting for all concerns when it comes to this sort of bill. And, and we want to make sure that there is no freak out about um, you know, whether or not the government is now going to be um, prohibited from regulating the growth of marijuana in people's, you know, arts. Um, and that's, you know, our institutional expertise is definitely helpful in developing and drafting these bills. But then, you know, we're also a national organization and uh, we have resources and we have the audience uh, to whom we can amplify a message of this importance. And that's why it's, uh, you know, I, I hope uh, helpful to Nicole and to this um, this effort and this campaign that IJ has come on board and we're able to put a little bit more institutional oomph behind this in the hope that this is the year that it gets across the finish. Uh, I will say that uh, something, oh, did I, I think I forgot to send that to you, Ari. Uh, uh, there's, and I will, uh, I, a friend of mine sent me information from another suburb uh, of Chicago, which is um, Winnetka. And there's a guy in Winnetka who put uh, raised beds on his parkway. Some people call them hell strips. Uh, you used another term, I think, Ari. Um, swale. Swale, right. They call them swales in certain parts of the country. Um, and he's facing problems. Uh, he went to the city first and said, hey, is this okay? And, of course, the city said, yeah, sure, go ahead. And then, of course, the minute he put it up, uh, they came after him. And uh, so now he's fighting uh, Winneka City Hall, and, and we're going to investigate that as well because I really – and it's a beautiful – I've seen the photo. It's a beautiful structure. It's unlike anything else on the block because everything else is lawn. Um, but there he is, growing vegetables and sharing them with his neighbors, and uh, God forbid uh, we should do that. Um but that brings me back to the Elmhurst question, Nicole. Uh, not only are you working in Springfield, but Elmhurst is having an election this year. Uh, how is yes. <laughs> yeah? <laughs> how is your issue affecting that election? Well, it's interesting because it's been going on for so long. Uh, it's quite well. Um, it's been discussed in the community for a very long time. So now it is definitely a topic which the community is bringing up to uh, various candidates, whether mayoral candidates or people running for aldermen. So I'm happy to see that having stuck with it for a while, it's sort of permeated the collective consciousness of the community and they're looking for answers because I think a lot of people, uh, whether or not you're interested in gardening, it is somewhat discomforting to people to believe that they live in a community which uh, does not execute their code enforcement in an equal manner, that they should mm -hmm. uh, allow certain people to do things while barring others from doing the same behavior for reasons that can't 
clearly or objectively or rationally be explained. This is discomforting to a large percentage of the community, and so it should be. So let it be discussed during the campaign. I, I'm, I'm not convinced at much at all that the, the city council would reverse its position. Nonetheless, it's good, for, um, it's good for the conversation to see the light of day. And at this point, let's face it, uh, City Hall has dug in its heels. It has said, we're yeah. not going to let this woman win. All right. Um, um, do, do you think that's going to make a difference in the election at all? That uh, I, 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 And you, you mentioned to me that there are, seem to be two sides. There's the people who are not going to talk about it at all and others who acknowledge the issue and say, yeah, this is an important right. Yeah, I mean, it's already made a difference. Uh, many people have come to me asking my recommendation for candidates based on my experience mm -hmm. with the various aldermen, um, you know, in the past five years. Uh, it's, uh, there's four candidates, three of whom are currently sitting aldermen, so I have, I have exposure to all of them. And so many households in the community have asked for my input. I have given it, and they have chosen... Mm -hmm or they have given me feedback that their family will vote accordingly with my recommendations in mind. So I, I'm sure that it has had an impact. I don't know if it'll tip the scale ultimately, but you know, it is having an impact. Are you going to put any of those recommendations uh, in public on, uh, on, on your social media or, is, or you, it's just a personal thing? No, I have, um, you know, there's two specific aldermen who, have reached out and been very clear uh, in Ward 1. I'm, I'm in Ward 5, but uh, in Ward 1, uh, both Susan Zmentek and Kevin Flanagan have been open, ardent, and continuous supporters of uh, property rights and, and hoop houses, not miniature ones that I have to bend over in, but something tall enough for a human being to stand mm -hmm. up and work in. And they've been clear about that and consistent. And Michael Bram is running for mayor, and he's been in my opinion, the most fair and ethical uh, person running for mayor at this time. He's the one that we would support in our household. Okay. So uh, if for any of you who are watching us or listening and live in Elmhurst, those are a couple of, or several recommendations from Nicole. Um, I, personally, Nicole, how are you dealing with this? Uh, do you get tired? I'm sure you get tired, but I would imagine New Year, You've got uh, uh, the Institute. New gardening season coming. Right. The Institute <laughs> for Justice is involved, and you've got uh, people behind you in Springfield. It must give you, you must get bumped up a little bit, even though you've been doing this a long time. Well, when, when Ari was talking about some of what IJ brings to the table, I wanted to see if I could squeeze this in here at one point. One, it, it, it's probably um, something they're less aware of than I am, but... I have been doing this mostly on my own for so long that to have Institute for Justice come along with um, the elements they bring to the table that are so encouraging to me, primarily the number one element is they listen to me. <laughs> <laughs> and it's so encouraging to work with an organization of people who feel that the input that I have is valuable and worthy and gets incorporated into the actual strategy or the action plan, that just is kind of a boost to the morale when you've been working on something a long time. Of course, other organizations have done that. You know, I've been working with other people in the past, um, but each organization has their own culture and each organization has their own, you know, individual members. And I have to say, thank you, Ari. You've been great at that. He's been very responsive. And uh, Melanie also on the IJ team has been very responsive. Um, it, it's, it's been a very unique, um, you know, there's, like I said, there's been several organizations I've worked with, but Institute mm -hmm. for Justice is the creme de la creme, I will say. So uh, the, the morale boosting element has been, it's been significant because the fatigue and the war weariness, it does, it gets tiring after a while. So yeah. mm -hmm. um, the morale boosting, it's, it's, I appreciate it more than I even realized I would have. It's a shot in the arm. And Ari, uh, I went to your website and took a look at some of the battles you guys fight. And I'm imagining that the reaction from Nicole is not unusual. 
No, it's not. It's still always really gratifying to hear people say that. Um, and it's, it, you know, it's a pleasure to work with Nicole. Um, and so while she's, you know, thankful for our, our involvement, we're, we're always thankful to be able to work with people like her, people who, um, who understand an issue um, and recognize the importance in fighting for it um, because mm -hmm. certain things need to be fought for. And when you talk about, um, you know, how is she feeling and, and whether she's war weary, uh, you know, I've been working on this issue myself um, probably since about 2015 or 14 or so, not entirely in Illinois uh, with Nicole, but starting in Florida. And it is incredibly frustrating that we have to fight about this, that we have to fight about whether or not you have a right to grow food in your own yard and on your own property. Um, but nevertheless, we do. Um, and the, the, the good thing about that, I guess, is it, it allows us to connect with people like Nicole and to be able to work in places like Illinois with some like-minded uh, public officials. And it, you know, it prevents you from getting cynical and, and you know, it reminds you that there are people out there who do care about really important things. Um, and, and this is one of them. And, you know, there are, I will say, a lot of challenging questions that we face as a society about you know, what constitutional interpretation and what is good or bad public policy. I don't really think this is one of those hard questions. I think that this is an easy question. <laughs> Certainly you ought to be able to do this. Um, yeah. The fact that we have to fight about it is a little bit aggravating sometimes. Um, we're yep. so happy to fight it alongside people like me. Yeah, I, 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 I'm with you there. All right, we're yeah. out of time. Thank you so much, uh, Ari Bargill and uh, Nicole Virgil. Good luck. Uh, here we go again. It's a long ride, uh, but and, and, um, and folks can go to Right to Garden to find out how they can contact their legislators, right? Yeah, righttogarden.com and uh, Facebook forward slash Right to Garden. Yeah, Great. and uh, by the way, the uh, the bill this year is called the Illinois Vegetable Garden Protection Act. Uh, I believe it was called Right to Garden in the past, wasn't it, uh, Nicole? It was. All right, so it's now the Illinois Vegetable Garden Protection Act, if, you, if you're confused and you can't find Right to Garden among the bills. But it is House Bill 633 and Senate Bill 170. Uh, Ari and Nicole, thank you. Um, I hope we don't have to bring you back except for when you have victory. Uh, th then we can, uh, we can celebrate a little bit here. Um, but uh, continued success, and uh, I'm sure we'll talk again very, very soon. Thanks, Mike. All right. It's Thank the Mike you. Novak Show with Peggy Molecki. Rick DeMaio, meteorologist and author, is next. At this time of year, we spend a lot of time indoors with our plants, so help them thrive. The plants you're viewing were treated with Leafzyme, a foliage spray designed to activate beneficial microbes already present on the leaves. A spritz every few weeks promotes growth-enhancing microorganisms that process dust and other particles into nutrition that indoor plants can absorb through their leaves for beautiful and vigorous growth. Go to blazing-star.com and check out their BioGarden line for home gardeners. From small boat fishermen to your dinner table with safe, free, no-contact delivery, Sitka Salmon Shares brings premium wild Alaska seafood to your door. They're a community-supported fishery offering shares just like your local CSA. All fish is wild caught in season with respect for the limits of the ocean. Line caught and traceable to their fleet. Use promo code NOVAK25 for $25 off the first month of a share. Go to SitkaSalmonShares.com slash N-O-W-A-K. Hello from Happy Leaf. This is BJ Miller, the horticulturist here on staff. The best way we can help you be successful with indoor gardening is to provide you with a really great grow light. There are a lot of choices on the market and it can be extremely confusing to decide what you need. Our goal here at Happy Leaf is to provide you with a light that lasts a very long time and makes your plants really happy. We have several satisfied customers, including our friends Mike Novak and Peggy Malecki, because we have specifically designed a light that is versatile, it's very effective, and it is extremely simple to use. Our lights are perfect for seed starting, but you can do so much more, especially these months of the winter. You can supply yourself with your own leafy greens and herbs, grow lots of different types of vegetables, keep your small fruit trees thriving, and your houseplants will think you've sent them for a day at the spa.
And it's my turn to tell you that the Evanston Environmental Association's Environment. Wild environmental associations wild and scenic film festival goes virtual this march so you can attend from the comfort of your home this year's films we've been telling you about these uh, great films i think we're gonna uh, add a couple more here uh for the next and, and maybe we can show a clip like we've been doing for the one earth film festival um We've got the first African-American male to complete the triple crown of hiking, how church forests in Ethiopia protect the biodiversity of old growth forests, and the story of one community's fight to keep an oil refinery closed after an explosion. This special event happens on two nights, March 19th and 26th, uh, 630 to 9 p.m. Tickets are available starting at $10. All proceeds support the Evanston Ecological Center. For more information and to register, visit evanstonenvironment.org slash film fest and let's bring in meteorologist and author published author published author uh rick demayo as a matter of no, fact no, that would be richard demayo richard you're right. <laughs> you're right richard demayo let me pop this up here there it is folks uh, there is the book weather and aviation not just one but one and two by richard demayo and i imagine uh rick you were you actually took that photograph and you were standing there in the runway and and and, <laughs> of, and of course the tower's going uh there's a guy down there on the right uh, watch watch that lift off there there's some guy with a camera yeah. uh and, so. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm going like i'm going like this with the sticks <laughs> Like yeah yeah exactly, so, so it and it's a selfie stick too. Then he turns it around. And he says, and watching the hair get tussled and the wind blown. So yeah. uh, hey, congratulations, Rick. The uh, the Thanks. the book is out. Uh yeah, you know me. I'm a modest guy. I don't really like to talk about this too much. But if you have a half hour, I'm fine with it. <laughs> Yeah, great lake size, lake breeze, warmth, <laughs> rainfall. Nah, we don't need to talk about that. <laughs> a, a lot of, a lot of, a lot of days um, at, believe it or not, Evanston Library um, mm -hmm. over the past two summers. But last summer, actually, what am I saying? Not last. Last summer, the library was closed, so I was trying to find most of my time um, in, you know, hided, you know far away places that were quiet so I can get my head around this. Um, but yeah, this has been something I've been wanting to do for a long time. I've written some stuff, you know, at United Airlines. And part of it was because I, I, I still haven't found to this day, and I'm not, I'm not still completely satisfied with, with the content. I still want to tweak a bunch of things in it. So um, it's, it's hard for me to really pat myself on the back. Uh, but we do got a bunch of schools looking at it, not only aviation schools, uh, but also community colleges, you know, your two-year schools will most likely be mm -hmm. adopting volume one, which was written uh, so that you can do a normal intro to weather class. And then volume two, which is used for your aviation schools, is about 35 of them uh, in the United States. Um, that's where it in includes things like, you know, icing and turbulence and instrument meteorological conditions and hazardous weather and how weather is observed and forecasted and used to operate you know the weather around the tower uh the air traffic control center and then the national airspace and a lot of this i learned on the job uh when i got to united airlines so you know three months out of school when i got the job i had no idea about aviation weather you learned while you were doing and mm -hmm. oftentimes you hear kids saying well, I can't believe that, you know, I got out of school and how little I actually learned in college. But you can't learn everything in four years of college. You learn how to learn. Yeah. <laughs> so when you and get it's not in context world, in college necessarily. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you're learning a lot of, you know, of your of your fundamentals and your basics. And then you put the context to use when you get into real world situations and, you know, uh, you know, become engaged and, you know, adaptation and things like that and it was always it was always intriguing to me that people would say oh you're a meteorologist you could be wrong and still you know get paid and i'm thinking to myself if you've ever been in an operational environment 
where you're making decisions for, say, snow plows or airplanes or airports um, or air traffic control centers, you know, see how long you keep your job. Yeah. Um, yeah. So rather than most people, you know, attribute someone who's a meteorologist to someone who's on TV. Um, that was on TV full time for 12 years, another five years after that. I was never really satisfied. I mean, you got three and a half minutes. I mean, are you kidding me? And then you're basically saying the same thing, you know, over and over again. I always strive to do more. Um, and there's very few people who have that much time or that much ability um, or that many options to do more. Skillin is really the only person I know who has that, um, how has that out, um, ha has that ability to do that, not only from uh, the website and the Tribune, but also the newspaper itself. And TV is probably the smallest part of Tom's day. Um, so yeah, it's it's there's a lot of cool stuff in it. And uh, when I do the second edition, which will probably be in three or four years, I'm going to do a lot more with climate change, especially mm -hmm. from a standpoint of managing airports. I still have like two more chapters that I want to write. So um, um, it's been a lot of sweat equity. I haven't made much money off of this yet. Trust me. <laughs> no, <laughs> and there's uh, a whole digital component too, isn't there, on the website? Well, the entire. Yeah, the the entire book is digital. It's all it's all online. There's okay. there's not a printed copy out there. So wow. um, when schools adopt it, what they can do is um, right away it can be you know uploaded to um, you know a PC. It could be uploaded to a Mac. It could be uploaded to an iPad. Um, it could be uploaded to a phone as long as you have the code to get into it. So. Mm -hmm. This allows also the ability to do remote learning. Um, even though I started thinking about this about three years ago, when the pandemic hit, all of a sudden I'm like, wow, actually this could be a lot more valuable than I thought. So I started yeah. to write more of the book, the first volume, more as an intro to weather book, whereas it was supposed to be only aviation. And the, you know, the editor, we sat down and we, not, you know what, I have never met the editor or the or the designer never it's all been through zoom the entire mm -hmm. process has been through zoom they're a company great river learning which is a subsidiary of kendall hunt um, which publishes a lot of textbooks and they're out in dubuque iowa and we have never met in person the entire process has been through zoom and this was even before yeah. the pandemic it's been good so the bottom line is as peg was alluding to not only is it digital but you can up things so when students are pulling up say you know chapter four which is all about you know wind and surface weather patterns as they're going through the book they can literally click on a link and it'll pull up the current weather map for your area wherever you are and you can click on you know air traffic control briefings um, in chapter 19 when you get into volume two and you can literally save those links to your phone or your iPad nice. or your yeah so so the book is 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 made so that it, it's just something that's not static that when mm -hmm. you get it okay it, it's it's old as soon as it's printed even even the book I use for Loyola for um, climate change the book is six years old I probably use less than half of the content because I have so hmm. much to update all the time yeah. you know what's the current CO2, what's the current status on El Nino? What's the current status on Arctic sea ice? And even when I was reading the book, this is you know from a notable author, I'm like, but you have nothing in here that enables me to teach this five years from now. Yeah, so the idea- it's static. Behind, yeah, it's totally static. So the idea behind having something that's completely online is you can literally go through each of these chapters and the homeworks and the quizzes and the labs and the case studies and the PowerPoints, that's all in there. Um, and literally, it, it's, it's, a, it's a book that's meant to be used forever. And, and the only way it can be changed is if I go in there and go, I, I need to move things around a little bit. Yeah. And trust me, and there's, we're not there's printing not a books that are going to go out of date. Right. And, and, and it saves paper. It saves the, the cost of, 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 of printing the book, which is a lot. It saves ink. Uh, it saves the, the the room in your backpack, which you ever seen a kid these days? Their backpacks are like tilted because their mm -hmm. bodies are like this. So I was thinking about the environment about this a long time ago. 
Um, and it's, uh, yeah, we, we finally sent it to market, and um, hopefully a lot of people will pick through the aisles and, and choose me. <laughs> so, so we've already got somebody online asking about getting your book. How, so how do people get this if someone's interested? You know, if, if someone wants it just from a weather standpoint, um, I can send them the, the, the link to the access code. It's real easy. It's grlcontent.com grl content which is great river learning um and then they can probably go in there and purchase it um it's 80 bucks mm -hmm. which is actually cheaper than most textbooks i don't know if you've been to a college textbook store um no, not lately they're really, they're really expensive i mean you're you're coming out of there with 125 135 dollar books really really well, costly. that was usually the total i paid when i was in college oh yeah and, and mean, you I can't don't... sell any of them because they're out of date by next week yeah, and, and that and that really sucks because these kids are paying all this money for a book that three or four years later is usually what the turnaround time is. The next edition is out. And the school says, nope, we're going to use the next edition. And you know how many times I have students come to me and say, Mr. DeMaio, I got edition four. Is that okay? Because edition five is what the school wants us to use. I'm like, use edition four. <laughs> I, I, do, I do one of those I got it used, um, but but yes. I, but I'll tell you this: the the idea, uh, and it, and it makes sense that you have this online so that you can just click links. When I do garden talks, for example, I I, I will do a handout, and uh, a few times uh, in the past year, because of the pandemic, I was sending uh, out uh, the handout via email, and I realized, oh my goodness, those because I, I have a whole front page with just links. And I realize if it's on a piece of paper, very few people are going to go to those links and, and check it. But if it's on a, uh, on a, in an email mm -hmm. and you just go click and you go right to the, yep. to the link, it's much more effective. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I have not, I have not, that's a ding. I have not handed out a piece <laughs> of paper in my classes in the last two years. Yeah. In the la I'm not, I'm, I'm kidding. Nothing. There's, I, I always tell my students, this is a paperless class. No paper, yep. no paper, no yep. paper, no paper. Everything, yep. exams, quizzes, homework, uh, labs, everything is is electronic. And I'm and I always say, if you want these powerpoints, just download them and save them. And yep. then the links. I already have kids going. I've already saved. I already have fifteen bookmarks from the first four chapters, and I'm trying to figure out which ones to use. It. We all do. I mean, I got like a thousand bookmarks yeah. that I go through. Um, so yeah, I mean that, that's it's it's nice, and thank you for mentioning it. Um, I appreciate that. Uh, so so Rick, getting on to some other things here. Um, <laughs> no no no, he, we, we haven't we haven't filled up the entire half hour about his book yet. So uh, no, all right. Let's. <laughs> I noticed how close how cold it got yesterday next to the lake, versus oh my god, about, oh, five miles west. It's you know, that season. And, and it's, yeah, and and it's amazing because you know Peg and I, you know, we live close to the lake. You can walk outside and not even know what the weather is, and you can almost tell that the lake breeze kicked in because it's mm -hmm. that it's that kind of cool, like minty, fresh spearmint kind of. <laughs> it smells and different. You're running for your jacket, going, but it was warm at nine o'clock this morning. Right, right. It, it it totally smells different. You can almost sense there's a little bit more dampness in the air, even though the sky mm -hmm. is clear, and you always know that we've had a pretty decent lake breeze the day before when you wake up in the morning you see frost everywhere because that little yeah. bit of moisture came in settled and then froze um and yeah we've had we've had a number of those particularly uh during the day on what was it thursday i think we got really warm on wednesday yeah it was high of 59 and then all of a sudden the next day the wind came off the lake granted that was a front yeah. but i mean it went down 20 degrees it was really cold so yeah. one of the things that um, I think is important to note is that the lake water temperature is about 33 or 34. The lake's completely free of ice. The Great Lakes themselves, mm -hmm. as of today, um, I, I think it's down to about 12%. And I, I still think yeah, you're, about you're, this. You're, I think your email said 15. Was it 15? Yeah, about 15%. So. And, um, and I still remember it was <laughs> on this date yesterday in 2014 – when the Great Lakes were at ninety-two percent, wow! And that was yeah, that was. The team. But but even even two years ago, even two years ago, 
we were about 90%. Now, here's the difference between surface of the, you know, surface ice and how thick it is. So there's actually two different sites that you can see on the G-L-E-R-L -L website, the Great Lakes Environmental Research Lab. Great site to look at. Uh, it comes out of Michigan. And what's nice is they have not only the sea ice um, surface, but also the concentration. So back in 2014, not only did we have a lot of ice, but it was really thick, which is one of the reasons why uh, March of that year, 2014, was the third coldest in Chicago ever since they moved the observation site um, mm -hmm. to O'Hare. And I remember when the National Weather Service did a study, some, I think they had like a, uh, a new person there, like an intern, and they posted the study on how this March compared to, you know, recent mar you know, past marches and then recent marches. And they put the study out and I said, guys, I hate to say this, but you didn't really take into account that the first 20 of the coldest months of March are when the National Weather Service site was downtown. And then it mm. moved to Midway and then it mm. moved to O'Hare. That's totally different. And you can hear the guy on the phone going, yeah, I think we needed to look at that. And it was a, it was a, it was a study done. It was a study done by an intern. I go, look, I hate to I hate to squash this, but these aren't really truly representative. And you know, the next day the study was down, and then they went back and they redid it, redid it with a bunch of asterisks. So when you look at March of 2014, it was the coldest since 1980 when we had all of that ice. Um, and then even when you go back even two years ago. It was super cold the first week of March, and then after that, it got really warm. And even though you may have a lot of ice on the lakes, if the ice is thin and you get a couple of those warm days that's very windy, the water that then goes on top of the ice basically submerges it, melts it, and then the satellite can't see it. So you can go from 90% to 15% in two weeks if the ice is thin. If the ice is thick, it's a different story. That's why it's so important when we talk about sea ice coverage in Antarctica, it's not just the surface, but it's also the thickness as well. Um, the question is, what does this mean for us? Right now, to me, even though we've had a couple of really cool days with that lake breeze kicking in, if we get a couple of mild days, which we'll do coming up, um, I think you can say that the chances of a long lake breeze season um, is going to be kind of minimal this, this, this year. Good. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> There's nothing like going out in the afternoon for a walk and going, "Woo, wait a yeah, second, right. it's so cold." Yeah, not only that, not only that, Peg, and and you've done it, I know, as much as I. But it's sunny out, and you can see your breath, right? <laughs> right. It, yeah, yeah. And everybody else is getting their gardening going, and and the soil here is still way too cold. Yeah. And of yeah. course, uh, I'm in the city, so I've I've got the heat island effect mm -hmm. here. Um, and but you'll, still, you'll still get a lake breeze there, I mean, but you know, I'm, I'm at least a mile in from, uh, the, the lake, maybe yeah. even more. I have to uh, chart it someday and just see exactly how far I am because I'm, th uh, 3,500 West. Yeah. So three, mi three, three miles in probably. Is, is that yeah. three miles and, in? So that's, it and, make, that makes a huge difference. And sometimes it's not where you are East West. It's where you are from a Northeast. So the way the lake breeze comes in from the northeast, you always have to take where your point and move it to where you are. You follow what follow I'm saying there? Yeah. So you have to you almost have to like what the trajectory is at that point. Uh, mm -hmm. But anyway, I know people want to talk about gardening. So there's a bunch of stuff that I sent you regarding um, how de how deep the uh, the uh, the perma how deep the frost is and how much moisture is in the ground right now. If you want to talk about that, we can. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Um, uh, which uh... Okay, is this the stuff you sent this morning? Yep. Yeah. Uh, you want me to talk about it? Yeah, okay. yeah. Let's go let's, for it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll ask myself the question. How yeah, you, you do that because it came in at eight forty-five, and I'm like, uh, I haven't seen this yet. <laughs> so, so, hey, Rick, right. <laughs> what's the soil temperature right now, and how deep is the uh, frost level? <laughs> well, Peg. <laughs> um, well, the, as I mentioned, you know, like three weeks ago. The snow that we had did not have a lot of moisture in it. It only had about an inch and maybe about an inch and a quarter of water. That's one of the reasons why it basically evaporated um, almost 13 inches in about seven days. There's still wow. a lot of piles out there, but I guarantee you by Thursday morning, 
all the piles will be gone. And the reason why is not only is it going to get warm, but it's going to get humid. We have not had much in the way of humidity, and therefore at night has been able to cool off. That's one of the reasons why the snow has that kind of icy look to it. So it keeps refreezing, refreezing, refreezing. Yeah. Whenever you get a windy, warm, humid night, that stuff just shrinks like crazy. So it'll not only melt, it'll actually evaporate into the atmosphere. You'll actually see fog coming off the snow packs. Yeah. Oh, cool. Uh, probably by, yeah, probably by, I would say by Tuesday night, when the humidity jumps up to like the dew points in the 50s, just like last Sunday. Remember last Sunday, we had dew points in the upper 40s, and we had that dense fog come across, but it lasted for about four or five hours. This is going to be about 45 hours that it's going to happen. So beginning uh, tomorrow, it'll warm up into the low, low to mid-60s, all the way to the lakefront. Um, Tuesday, Wednesday, and probably even Thursday, uh, we'll see a pretty decent shot of warm human air, and this snow will basically be gone by then. Wow. Uh, the question is whether or not the rains that come will produce flooding. The, the ground still isn't really that saturated, and because we've been warming up, it's not frozen. So I don't think you're going to get any, any way, anywhere in the way of any flooding rains. Uh, this is good news. If you want to do some gardening where you can get those sticks in there, you know, those pokers and get the holes in, um, probably tomorrow is a good day for that because the rain won't get here until Wednesday night. And it looks like anywhere between about an inch and a half and two inches between mm -hmm. Wednesday night wow. and Thursday, and then maybe another round during the day on Friday. So we've been dry. Um, and it's also been a slow melt-off process. And I think, you know, Pig said pictures of crocuses. Am I right? You had some crocuses that were coming up? Uh, snowdrops. 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 Um, I know that, Mike, you were talking about daffodils. Yeah, they're coming I, up. Yeah, yeah stuff mine too. Blooming. Yeah, stuff is blooming. So as cold as we were and as snowy as we were, it was very, very short-lived. And some of the other um, images I sent you, which are really amazing, because people are, are constantly trying to think about how the Great Lakes are affected by climate change. If you look at the overall trend of ice, it, it, it's a real slow drop off from like the late 70s to the late 210s. It really doesn't, you don't really see a huge difference in the overall amount of ice. You see a lot of this, but if you look at Lake Superior, and you look at Lake Erie, those are the two lakes that typically freeze the most. You see the last 30 years, and instead of having ice like this in Lake Superior last 30 years, it's like this. Mm. And what you see mm. there is the variability in the light that makes it all the way south. And the reason why Lake Erie freezes up is because Lake Erie is a very shallow lake. Lake Ontario is very deep. And it's also a little yeah. bit further north, and they get a lot of those west winds. So Lake Erie freezes up more so because it's shallow. Lake Superior freezes up because it's an east-west lake, and it's easy to get that lake ice build along the bottom, and then it basically builds back up. But they're also much, much colder. Yeah. Lake Michigan mm -hmm. almost never freezes up because even if you get ice on the west side of the shore, when we get cold, the wind blows from the west and pushes the ice to the other side. So yeah. it's more or less the geography of the lakes that allows them to freeze or refreeze. But if you want to send those images of Lake Erie and Lake Superior, that's one of the real, I think, definitive ways of showing how our climate has become much more variable. We actually made it through this winter without any brutal northeast winds and um, lakefront erosion so far we've been doing okay with the lack of ice because normally by the time you get to the end of march there's no ice anymore so this was one of those years where we lucked out even though the adaptation mitigation efforts put forth by communities like evanston and wilmette will probably go unnoticed they had to do them and i guarantee you do two years where you do something and nothing happens the third year goes yeah. do we really need to do this <laughs> and of course the year they don't the lake yeah, probably right. gets all right. Yeah. Well, there'll well, still be enough storms. <laughs> yeah. Well, we need a forecast here and uh, to wrap it up. Yeah. So uh, mid fifties today, lower forties from about Sheridan Road East. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm uh, not. I'm not east of there. So. <laughs> well, we got we. What <laughs> one of our our listeners says west of Ridge Green Bay is another climate altogether. Yeah. So. Yeah. yeah. 
And, you, and also, you got to remember the way the way Cook County and, and West Lake of Eden County, is another one. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. It also kind of angles in like that. You know, it yeah. kind of has that little bit of angle, so you can go like behind Temple straight north, and you're ten miles east of Milwaukee over the lake at that yeah. point. Uh, but the bottom line is mid to upper fifties today. Low 60s tomorrow, mid 60s Tuesday, ditto on Wednesday, but more importantly, overnight lows. Get this, overnight lows, probably 45 to 50, both wow. Tuesday wow. night and Wednesday night. Yeah, so that that's really what's going to kill the snow. Um, and by this time next week, we'll be back in the 40s. So enjoy the next three or four days. All right. So Don't get too used to 60s. Uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. Well, <laughs> yeah. Uh, congratulations on the book, Rick, and uh, we'll uh, we'll see you next week. Okay, sounds good. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, All right. Mike. Bye-bye. Uh, okay, uh, one more thing before we go. I know we're running just a, a tad over here, but I just had to play this for you. Shut up, Wesley. All right, so there we go. Uh, <laughs> I just had Next to, week, there's coffee in that nebula, huh? Uh, uh, I'm, that's, that is on the list of things to get to. I, I didn't want to have, you know, didn't want to have uh, too Over much. Over Star a, Trek it. Of, uh, right, exactly. If we just have too much Star Trek there, then uh, and now I'm and now I'm looking for oh there this guy. Yes, there we go. Uh, wow, what a show! This was great. Every uh, all, thank mm-hmm. all the people here. Uh, if I can uh, find the list, you want to help me with this? Here we go. Uh, so we want to thank Marie Chiepo. Chiepo from Ecological Landscape. I'm sorry, from Eco Plant Plans LLC. Kaida. Uh, Mahan and Jana Kinsman, Jana Kinsman from, from Bikeabee. Bike-a-bee. You can go to bikeabee.com. Uh, Nicole Virgil, Ari Bargill, uh, good luck to them. Uh, Rick DeMaio, congratulations to Rick. Thanks to Kathleen. Uh, thanks to uh, uh, Gata and Basil. Gata and Basil. Until next time, go green or go home. Let's find this thing. Where's the? Uh, it's here someplace. Here we go. Ha, 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 ha.